It's day two of CES. I believe this is the best of CES on day two. <laughs> I'm here oh, with it's Dan. It's the best, all right. I mean, is this the best? Because here we are. Okay, I'm here with Dan Ackerman, everybody. It's Brian Cooley. We're live at CES 2020. This is our second recap, recap of day two, our best of the products by a lot of metrics, not necessarily a ranked, graded thing, but on an impression level. What we thought was cool. Cool. Cool, interesting, and yet not trivial. Worth talking about. Worth talking about, exactly. Quick thing before we move forward, show of hands in the audience. I wish we could see a poll on the, out in the, uh, on the stream as well. How many of you remember SCSI ports? Yeah. See? See, see. We were just talking about, you know, hold up your laptop. Yeah. The okay. USB-C only here's what I carry. versus the All ancient. All the ports, um, right? I hate dongles, and he apparently loves them. But we were saying, he was saying, the only thing you're missing on that thing, cool, is a SCSI port. And I thought, wait, do I have one? No. All right. I am missing It's not that, that old. <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, here we old. are. Best of CES yeah, so far, day two. We got a lot of things to get to, and let's get to them in no particular order. First of all, start with one of the silliest, in a sense, the Samsung Bali robot, B-A-L-L-I, gets it. I won't go there. Gets in the companion robot game. Here it is. It's, it's another one of these um, Real you know, robots who wants to be your buddy. Real small. Uh, wants to follow you around the house. Has a little camera built in. Yeah. Uh, people get excited about these companion robots for a hot minute, and a lot of them don't really have staying power. You remember everybody was really into – this looks a lot like a Sphero. Everybody was super yeah, into Sphero right, a couple of years ago. Right. Every, everyone had the BB-8 robot, but nobody's yeah. driving their Sphero BB-8 <laughs> around anymore. And then there was uh, Vector from Anki which had the little cool personality and the face and stuff. And Anki, oh, I think, the, just went out the, of business. Oh, the, yeah. the green eyes, right? And, and that was actually really interesting. It had a lot of good AI hooks, but, but did not, uh, uh, you know, didn't do well enough to uh, keep the company around. Although a lot, of, a lot of parents in Brooklyn had to buy their kids vectors from Anki because they saw it at my house. Because you kids. have one at your house, and okay. And the kids were like, I want, I want vector for Christmas. So 90% of their sales came from the kids it in was your not neighborhood. Enough. And that was not was enough. Not, no, enough. Not, enough. Not, not that many kids in your neighborhood. But Bali, uh, they're pitching here as you know, like either a workout companion or something to keep your dog, your pets occupied during but the day. But let's break it down. It's functionality simple. I follow you around. And I, and I, and I shoot video. Okay. And I, saw, I saw a promotional clip where it was like following the dog around. Uh, is uh, it a all the, all the bad things the dog? It was narking out the dog. That's do you, what it is. Do you recall if it's, it's a, a remote view dog. camera? It's it's got to be video live. It's it's got to be able. Okay, to. Okay, because if it does that, then it knocks out one of the better promise things of Curry K U R I two mm -hmm. years ago Mayfield Robotics. It was the darling robot of that year. Poof, they're out of business as well, and they had Robert Bosch money behind them, and it didn't save them. Now, this is Samsung. They're not going to have a problem funding it. Um, all right, right so cool, it's pretty but who simple. Who's not going to step on that? Oh, like it's the first day. It's, it's pretty little, right? It's literally under. It better be tough. And I tell you, wandering around following the dog like that is going to make the dog nuts. So on a behavior and training animal front, I'm not sure it's the best policy if you've got a neurotic dog to have a, have a ball following it. That turns the whole dog thing on its head. It's supposed to go the other way it's around. Like I chase you. Dogs. You don't chase me. Okay, so that's Bali. Uh, now, Segway, that's Segway, has, uh, you all know what it's like, stand up, stalk, handlebars. It balances for you. But what if you wanted to just relax a little more? What if actually standing up on your, on your, mo you know, your, your movement device is just too much trouble? It's you want to work. sit down and relax. So you get into a seated Segway. This is the S-Pod. There's there, Lexi there. in there. Oh, oh, look at that. Did they really make her wear a crash helmet? I believe they, they forced is that what her America, to. Is that what the American Trial Lawyers Association has done to us? I'm sure she had to sign a waiver as well. Let me get this right. She's in, a, she's in a crash helmet in a padded device in a controlled track with guardrails. Going about three miles an hour. Although, I read that yeah. this thing can actually go up to like 20-something miles an it hour. It can. Okay. So you could actually really zip down. I'm pretty sure it's not street legal, uh, at least in New York, because... I remember you couldn't even drive a regular Segway on the on the That's sidewalk. That's a New York thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of cities pushed back hard when those came out 10 whatever years mm -hmm, ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the way this prints, this is the Google Glass of things with wheels, is if you're out there on a Segway, it's bad enough. If you're out on this thing relaxing and taking up a bigger footprint, you're the dick of the year. You I know. mean, you're out there <laughs> on the sidewalk saying, yeah, excuse me, excuse me. Come <laughs> through. That's well, not good. It, it's really... We used to have to do this by getting the chair, having four or five people hold the Right, the old the sticks, sedan chair of the and, 19th and, and century. And they pick you up and carry you around. Real good look today. Yeah, yeah right. you know, now you can do it without, without all the extra help. 
because <laughs> the stick carry guys were unionizing, and and you know, is, that, is that was the motivation? Is that yeah, what they said? So that's we the said, origin make story an automatic, for the Segway. Yeah, we, we, we have to make an automatic uh, version of that. Samsung uh, selfie type invisible mobile keyboard. Unless you see it, you have no idea what that even means. Well, you, know, you know, you you look in the uh, you look in the little catalogs in the in in, in the airplane uh, seat back pocket. Yeah. They always have the thing where like it'll laser yeah laser the invisible keyboard a keyboard in front of you. Yeah. And you just type with your fingers on the table, and they never work. Um, but this is a new version of that concept where your phone camera looks at your fingers, tracks your finger movement, and tries to figure out what you're typing. I think you have to train it. It has to train you. Which is good, because that's the only way you get this to work. Piece at this point. The it's only way you get this to work is with training. This cannot be out of the box calibrated. You remember the, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, we had the, uh, the early laser tracking keyboards yeah, that projected yeah. a keyboard on the table? Horrifying. Never They had no learning. And the thing is, they were using laser interruption as opposed mm -hmm. to image recognition. Yes. This is a big improvement in concept. I've not used it, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that you really have to know, sort of almost like don't look at it touch typing in order to do it, because I'm a, I'm a three-finger claw typist. But in theory, it learns that you are that. Although I don't know how it would take a few fingers and figure out all yeah. the QWERTY keys in, those, in a few fingers, but I'm sure it could. Very interesting. I mean, um, it, took us, it took us years and years to, to get people comfortable with the idea of typing on a screen like on an iPad or yeah. on a phone, but eventually we all did that. Who's so ever going to do that? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> we'll be, maybe we'll be here soon. Well, speak of that. Lenovo ThinkPad X1 folding laptop. Uh, the folding revolution, I think, here at CES this year really moved beyond phones. We got into some more folding phones, and we get now folding laptops that are really starting to literally bend the boundaries of what a laptop is. You know, the phones... Had, had some trouble in their first iterations. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you want to see the machine that we use to try and break one, it's right around the horn over <laughs> oh, there. That's right. Yeah. Um, the laptops make more sense to me because it's a bigger screen to begin with, and you have more real estate to put in all the protection that you need and the hinges and making sure nothing can get in through the sides. Yeah. Uh, and you can have something that's, you know, a phone, as you're pointing out, is a small screen that maybe folds to become a smaller, a smaller screen. screen. On the on the uh, X1 Fold or the Dell, or, or the Dell prototype that's very yeah. similar, yeah. it's a 13-inch screen. Okay, there it is. It's there, almost, if you're watching yeah, on the stream that's or here in the audience, uh, that's inch fully open. Right here. That's and basically you can fold uh, it in half and yeah. becomes almost like a mini laptop. Okay. Uh, you get a little on-screen keyboard, or you can put a little physical. Okay, let's let's see that in a second. There we go. There There's we go. the There's virtual the keyboard. keyboard. But then they also have a uh, huh. little physical keyboard that's magnetic uh, that clips on there. And you can open okay. it up and put the keyboard in front of it, and it's like a mini all-in-one desktop. And to me, that's a very flexible device. We'll Much see that here so in just a moment. Once we finish that, if that video keeps rolling, you're going to see the physical keyboard in a minute that shows you how it can be. That's still virtual keyboard. As this clip goes on, it's you'll like see a, that. It's, it's like a little add-on. And, and of course, this thing is going to be like $24.99. All right, uh, premium price. And guess what? The keyboard's extra. No, is it really? Yeah, they always do that, don't they? That's annoying. I, but I'm with you. I think this, this. I think folding devices of a larger size, whether we call it a laptop or whatever this category will be, makes more sense. I think I'm starting to come around to than small folding devices. Small and to smaller is not interesting. Mid to big is a real piece of real estate. Imagine you have a 13-inch screen and you have a bag that's very small, or and you don't want to put a 13. You literally fold it in half and you yeah. can put it in a much smaller space. Then you unfold it, and you're back to your 13-inch size. It's way more transformational because a folding phone is always going to be in your pocket or it's going to be in your pocket, whereas a laptop might be in your pocket in one case, and then it comes out, and it's something that you could not possibly, possibly put in a pocket uh, when it's opened up. So mm -hmm. it's actually ex exceeded a boundary that you used to have to observe. That's very interesting. And if you want to go even bigger, Intel has a prototype here that's the same thing but with a 17-inch screen. Same idea. Same idea. Bigger. Literally the same thing with huh. the keyboard and everything, but bigger. Okay, and the other thing you pointed out is, as you saw there, the keyboard is taking up a modest amount, when it's virtual, of real estate, meaning that you no longer have the 50-50 rule. Mm -hmm. uh, we've always got to do 50 screen, 50 chassis, and keyboard. That's just how these things are done, with a few exceptions. We have a, I forget who makes the laptop that has some helper screen. Yeah, yeah. Asus but for the most part, one, it's always know. done like this, but now we break the hegemony of 50-50. Now we can do 70-30 screen and, key and keyboard. It's taken us 30, 40 years to <laughs> yeah, right. you know, break out of that clamshell, took us a minute. like hinge in the middle, uh, and maybe we're finally there. Took us a minute. Okay, uh, let's take a look now in some health technology. Withings Scan Watch is what it's called. Does blood pressure, that's not table stakes yet, but I bet by next year 
It'll be table stakes for most wearables. Atrial fibrillation and O2, or oxygen perfusion levels. So this watch is really getting into some interesting, pretty deep monitoring. Now there's the app that goes with it. Uh, Scott Stein was talking about this with me on, on Sunday. We were looking forward to this. And what they can do here as part of their muxing together of this data is chase down sleep apnea. Yeah, and at least give you uh, the sense that you should go and get a more involved sleep test okay. rather than just guessing. You know, okay. it kind of, it's, it's an early warning detector in a way. Yeah. Uh, and, and, oh, you're, you're, you're not getting enough oxygen you know, during the night, so maybe you should go see your doctor and do an actual sleep study. This is part of the interesting sort of things we're doing with health tech is we're extrapolating one condition from a signal you didn't think was related. Oxygen perfusion mm -hmm. to apnea. We know they're connected, but they seem distant to us as we look at ourselves. But sensors say, oh, no, I look at this, and I know it's connected to this. Well, I, I know that AFib's connected to stroke. I know that low perfusion is connected to apnea. We can't see that with our eyes, but the sensors are so good at making those connections. And now the watches collect all these different kinds of data and can compare them and put them together. Yeah. You, know, you don't even know what they'll be able to diagnose for us going forward. Yeah. Withings has an interesting design language. As far as I know, just about all their products are a traditional it's watch very design. very watchy, yeah. That's interesting. I wonder why they've made that decision versus... In this particular case, it helps you have, I think, like something like 30-day battery life. Oh, okay. As opposed to something that's all screen where you have to plug it in every night. Okay, so small screen draw because it's a small inset screen with a traditional... Right. If you have a traditional watch, you know, with, with, with the hands, then your battery can last, you uh, know, okay, good, good, almost good forever. Thinking. Interesting. Okay, now we get really interesting. Uh, I had not seen this one until Dan showed it to me backstage. <laughs> the Prinker, not a typo, temporary tattoo printer. And I thought, okay, it prints temporary tattoos on a transfer paper and you put it on your arm. No, it prints them on you. So it's essentially a P-Touch label maker, but you're the tape cassette, and it puts it right on you. Let's take a look at this. Here we go. You load your design, That's I guess, right. or select it. Put the thing over your arm, and it goes Wow, it's that. quick. That is fast. It's real quick. And I guess uh, they just last a day or two. Oh, a day or two. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Okay. Huh. And you can Boy, buy either black ink, or you can buy a, co a color ink cartridge. Okay, good. You got some... Uh, you got some 007 going on there. They're always doing something like that to check the tracker they, they put under his skin. But this is put so barcodes in there. You can get like I a know, QR code right? Uh, right? tattoo. Right. And like, if I get lost, just scan this and, and, and you'll know where I am. The time is right. I mean, we know there's a huge, not huge, but a significant trend in tattoo removal technology clinics and appetite for that. Uh, this, uh, this eliminates that concern. Here, here you can just, you know, have a yeah. tattoo for today and no tattoo tomorrow. Did and you uh, see the output of it? What it uh, looks like when it... It looks okay. I, I think... Not I, as good as a real uh, tattoo? Well, no, but... Okay. But you can do it again. You know, if you can upload your own images, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you can just upload... I mean, it looks like it's basically I, clip sure art resolution. I'm sure at some point you'd be able to do that. I'm going to get a big Brian Cooley tattoo <laughs> right here. <laughs> oh. But only for one day. Okay, now it's all right. Okay, there. That's how it always is. They love me for one day. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Nice. That is it. Nice stuff. This, is, this, this was fun. Okay, that's it for day two of CES here at CNET's live coverage, Sands Expo, Tech West. If you're coming to the show still, you haven't been here yet or haven't been over here yet, we're at the top of the escalator. Come on up from where the cars drop you off, the cab curb, go to the top of the escalator, and you can't miss us. Uh, so we're right there. Hope we see you if you haven't come by already. We've got a lot more to come tomorrow where we will boil everything down. It's the show of shows. Some highlights. Dan will host the best laptops at CES. That's at 10 a.m. tomorrow. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Pacific. And, of course, I'll be back with the best overall products that our senior editors team has put together. And we're doing that at 11 o'clock. So Dan's got laptops, and Scott and I have the full roundup at 11 o'clock. Plus, we have Rick Harrison from Pawn Stars, local star, national star. And football great Joe Montana is going to come by to discuss sports recovery technology. So we'll see you for that. we got some really interesting stories tomorrow. We'll see you then for that. CNET Live from CES 2020. Good night. Okay.